In the 1984 film The Karate Kid, Ralph Macchio's character, Daniel, and his mother had just moved to Southern California from Jersey. Finally settling into their modest apartment and being the new kid on the block, Daniel finds himself the center of attention with a not-so-polite group of boys after having eyes for a girl who just so happened to be the ex-girlfriend of one of them. Long story short, the boys chase Daniel down to a fenced-in field and give him a welcome-to-town kind of workover. That is, until a Mr. Miyagi jumps in and doles out the karate chops, giving the punks a much-deserved thrashing as he rescues Daniel and carries him safely home. Miyagi, being a karate master who also just happened to be the handyman at Daniel's apartment complex, who just happened to be around when Daniel was getting chop suey happenstance? Uh, I don't know. But if you haven't seen the original trilogy, it's worth the time. I mean, I was nine when I saw it, so I don't remember much. But what the screenplay does get right are the key moments when life's lessons seem pointless at the time until you're suddenly dropped into an epicenter of chaos and your mind goes into action without a second's hesitation. Lessons in life are repeated until learned, it's been said. Even if the practice is dreadfully boring, practice makes perfect. Repetition is key, be it learning the piano or instilling life application skills like breathing techniques. We practice to prepare. We prepare to prevent, and we prevent to persevere. Though if your sacred song of inspiration is wax on, wax off, who am I to say, stick to what works best for you. But if I see you chasing flies with chopsticks, we may have a problem. Sanding floors, painting fences, or yes, chopsticking flies, Oddly enough, there's a valuable lesson we can take from this classic 80s film. And no, I don't mean the net t-shirts and parachute pants, Ugh, though they were comfortable. But let's find out. I'm Chad Lawson, and let's calm it down in 3, 2, 1. Daniel-san, as Mr. Miyagi so affectionately called him, had an extreme case of something we have all been affected by. Get their itis. <laughs> While you've never heard the word in any medical dictionaries, what I mean is we rarely see the purpose during our trip. We just want to get there. We're mostly oblivious until a Google map says, you have arrived. And then we look up to say, ah, oh, finally. It wasn't until Daniel lost it on his gentle-natured mentor that he learned how repetitive motions were methods of creating muscle memory to use instinctually during a fight. He was learning the art form all along, but simply not in the way he had envisioned it. In life, it's easy to look at our circumstances and assume they cannot be fixed by simple means. This is too grave of an obstacle to be fixed with something so elementary as breathing, we tell ourselves. My circumstances need more than a five-second count, you may say. And at times this may be true. Those breaths, those seconds, those moments we pause may not be the quick fix, but will often be the catalyst in calming the mind, allowing us to then rationally find such a remedy. I'm going to share with you today three simple but powerful ways to confront anxiety. So simple, mind you, that some will be quick to dismiss them as too simple. But focusing only on the what ifs and what's directly in front of you often keeps us from turning routine response into resounding reward. These simple techniques are only powerful when we have practice with such repetition, they become habit. When stress or anxieties arise, they should be our first go-to without us hitting the what do I do panic button. This is why I highly recommend you write these three steps down. Keeping the list in various places, such as your nightstand, 
your kitchen or your car, anywhere where anxiety tends to find you. When we apply these methods consistently, we will find the ability to neutralize the storms and overcome the obstacles, beckoning the calm, relaxed state of mind we so desperately seek. Number one, focus on the feeling. How you feel just before the anxiety takes hold, your feelings will change. Your present state of mind, it will change. Studies state panic attacks generally last less than 10 minutes in duration. But even those feelings of anxiety, of panic, they will resolve. When anxiety comes, Focus on what you expect to feel once it has passed. What will your feelings be once you begin to feel better? What's just past the potholes on the road, and what do you hope to see when you arrive? What do you expect to see or feel? Give yourself a blueprint of what to look forward to. For instance, I'm feeling anxious about this meeting or this conversation, or this appointment, this thing in front of me. But when this is all done, I expect to feel relieved, perhaps more informed, which makes things less uncertain, or perhaps feeling more calm and knowing that it's all behind me now. Focus on the feeling after the time of stress. Remember, your feelings will change. Write out these moments of high worries. Write down these expectations. Keep them with you. As I said before, the written word is stronger than the frantic thought. Your writing this down will negate any irrational thoughts your mind will spin your way, because it will. See the quicksand you have just stepped foot into, but focus on your next step being the solid ground just inches ahead. Number two. Thanks, but no thanks. You know that friend that shows up sometimes trying to help but just makes things worse? (laughs) Anxiety can be that friend. It's okay to be anxious. Telling yourself, hey, it's okay that I'm anxious right now. This is my first time doing this task or taking this test. Believe it or not, anxiety is doing its job of saying, hey, is everything okay up there? Before opening the adrenaline faucet. But it's up to us to say, thanks, I've got it covered. But like any good parent giving clear instruction, we have to give reason. We have to say why we are okay. Giving it feedback and examples that we're in control will calm the anxious thoughts and return the mind on its merry way. I do this by using something called stop, sigh, smile. I'm going to say that one more time. Say it with me. Stop, sigh, smile. First, stop where you are, and then sigh by slowly inhaling to a count of five, holding that for a second, and then slowly releasing that exhale to another count of five. And then smile. Stop, sigh, smile. Even if the smile is forced, smile. You are physically sending a message to your nervous system that everything is going to be okay. You're not pretending, you're resetting. These aren't typical reactions to high stress, and therefore our nervous system thinks, oh, false alarm, everyone back to watching cat videos. Remember, stop, sigh, 515, and smile. You are getting your control back. So when your first thought of stress pops up, address the mind by saying, no worries, all good, thanks. But no thanks, I've got this covered. And finally, number three. If, then. What if this happens? 
What if the interview doesn't work out? Well, then you've had your first practice go, and now ready for a second one elsewhere. You're warmed up. Yeah, but what if the second interview doesn't work out? Then, you've had two direct conversations with professionals in this circle, where you can ask, "Hey, after our conversation, are there things you would suggest I focus on or try to improve?" So, what then? What if I'm not accepted to Harvard? Well, then you may find better weather and education outside of Boston. If this happens, there can always be a then response to it. Weed through from top down to find the most logical approach at looking at every obstacle. If you're passionate about what you're doing, turn every stone in finding a door in. Plopping down on the if couch. Does absolutely nothing but locks our spot in a place we're trying to move away from. As author Ryan Holiday and countless Stokes before him have stated, the obstacle is the way. When there's an if, find a then. Let's practice a really simple mental reset. When we prime our awareness in concert with these and other techniques. We are giving ourselves not only tools to succeed, but a motivation to keep going, one step at a time. Now, before closing our eyes, let's begin, like we always do, with a simple, gentle breath. We're telling our mind we're about to begin. And allowing not only our body to prepare, but our mind as well, letting it know this is the first step in calming down. One more simple breath. Hmm. Perhaps even a slight smile, knowing that you are sending encouraging energy throughout your body. Okay. Closing the eyes and adjusting the body to find a comfortable and sustainable posture. Bring awareness to your mind. Your breathing. The quiet around you. Begin to detach any thoughts that you may have. And by that I mean, observe the thoughts as they come, but realize you don't need to commit to those thoughts. They do not sway your feelings, your emotions. They're just thoughts. Taking five seconds for a slow inhale. Five, four, three, two, one, hold. Exhale. Five, four, three, two, one. I just want us to sit just for a bit and notice our breathing. With our eyes still closed, I'd like for you to continue your awareness of your breath, the calmness, its slow, relaxed pace. While we're in this space. I'd like for us to go through these three techniques today. With your eyes still closed, I want you to visually go through these steps with me. Focus on the feeling. 
our thoughts change almost by the minute. In the midst of a storm, look just past the dark clouds. There is light ahead. What you see in front of you will soon pass. And when it does, what do you expect to feel? How do you hope to feel? Focus on the feeling. Secondly, stop, sigh, smile. Stop where you are. Stop by counting 515 and smile. Sending physical signals throughout your body to be calm, no need for alarm. Thanks, but no thanks. I've got this covered. And finally, if, then. If this, then this. There is always a way to find hope, to find a way of processing that will allow us to get through the circumstance. If, then. If this happens, then this is the step that I will take to move forward each day. One last deep, gentle breath. Hmm. So good. Slowly open our eyes, becoming aware of all that is around you. Noticing that you are safe. Noticing your mind is calm. Noticing how you feel right now. One last deep breath. And of course, a simple smile. These three techniques are powerful. Don't let their simplicity cast doubt to their ability to hold your hand through the high tides. It's the mundane we tend to overlook when in fact it's the key to a more resilient, healthier, and happier mindset. But it's practicing these mundane techniques each thought, each stress, each moment of anxiety, taking one or all three of these steps and applying them every time. Without practice, nothing can be achieved. Swami Satchidananda. Going back to the Karate Kid chase scene, I know, hard transition here. I noticed something so interesting in the rescue scene. It's so easy to miss in the movie that I wonder if it was just an oversight in filming. But when Daniel was being chased by the goons, he runs into a gated fence locked by a padded chain and he tries to climb his way over to which he's pulled down by one of the bullies. But once Mr. Miyagi jumps in and kicks everyone's butt and saves the day, he picks Daniel off the ground, opens the gate, and carries him home. The gate that Daniel tried to climb over. A decision he made in haste. The most difficult approach, rather than what may have been the most obvious 
easiest way to safety in the first place? Sometimes the answer is directly in front of us, but it's too easy. It's too obvious. When all alone, it's just a matter of stepping through that allows us to find the safer space. To find more episodes of Calm It Down, hear the musical playlist from today's episode, or simply wanting to know where to send chocolate chip cookies, visit CalmItDownPodcast.com. You'll even find additional resources for emotional support, including our online community and our Facebook page. You're not alone. You are not alone. This podcast was written and produced by yours truly, Chad Lawson, composer pianist, and nationally recognized, Sweet Tooth. And now something my attorney wants me to say. The views, expressions, and techniques in this episode are of my personal opinion and is not intended to, nor should they serve as a substitute for medical advice or diagnosis rendered to you by your individual doctor or other healthcare provider. Only a licensed physician should evaluate your situation, provide a diagnosis, or render other medical advice to you and you should only act upon the advice of such physician. Now, what I'd like to say. I am an extreme empath by nature, but my profession is that of a composer and pianist, not a licensed therapist or physician. I hear from thousands of listeners how my music has helped them through various stages of emotional needs, and I simply want to offer this and future podcasts in aiding those needs. To find a list of licensed professionals in your area, please visit CalmItDownPodcast.com. And finally, if you've enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review. While it takes less than 60 seconds to do, its impact will last for years to come as every little bit helps in growing the awareness and the importance of emotional health. I'm Chad Lawson, and until next time, be kind to your mind, and join me next week as we calm it down.